Uh, thank you very much for the invitation once again, and I'm sorry I can't see you, you can't see me be besides the video. So um, my presentation is going to be about the unforeseen uh, circumstances, uh, specifically the link between smoking, nicotine and COVID-19. So we know that uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus which, which causes COVID-19, uh, uses the uh, AC2 receptor for uh, cell entry. Um, specifically, there is a part in the uh, spike protein um, uh, of the virus that is called the receptor binding domain. And uh, in it, there is the receptor binding motif. It's the part of the protein that binds to the AC2, which is not, the AC2 is not a receptor, it's an enzyme. And here you can see a schematic of the amino acid sequence, the structure, the three-dimensional structure of the um, spike glycoprotein. And uh, you can see the part uh, in the red circle, which is the receptor binding domain, and within it, the receptor binding motif. And uh, SARS-CoV-2 also uses the uh, TMPRSS2 uh, serine protease, uh, a specific enzyme which needs uh, to prime the uh, spike glycoprotein in order, in order for the virus to uh, introduce its uh, genetic material. With smoking, we know that smoking is a major risk factor for respiratory infections, both uh, viral and bacterial both in terms of severity and in terms of susceptibility. And uh, here is a review from um, Benowitz uh, from 2004, uh, showing a much higher uh, risk for smokers compared to non-smokers for um, respiratory infections. And uh, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen uh, a lot of stories in the media discussing about smoking and unfortunately also about vaping. Uh, presenting both um, smoking and vaping as a risk factor for uh, COVID-19, susceptibility and severity. But there was no, no real data. Uh, everything was based on previous knowledge about uh, the link between smoking and uh, respiratory infections, but nothing uh, was known about COVID-19. So as um, Ricardo mentioned, uh, there are several studies that um, are now showing that smokers are underrepresented among COVID-19 patients, uh, especially hospitalized patients. I'm going to show you just two very recent data. I'm not sure if uh, Ricardo has already shown them. Uh, one is a study from Israel uh, evaluating almost 115,000 diagnostic tests, of which uh, 4,500 approximately were positive. And um, smokers were by far less likely to have a positive diagnostic test about 54% less likely to, to, to be tested positive compared to non-smokers. And uh, we recently released as a pre-publication and it's already been submitted for a, a publication in a scientific journal and it's under peer review. Uh, the largest case series of COVID-19 patients, it comes from a data set that uh, the Mexican Ministry of Health released. And uh, in this case, we still had approximately 23% lower um, prevalence of uh, smokers having a positive test, uh, diagnostic test for COVID-19 compared to non-smokers. So once again, uh, the data confirmed the previous study in, um, uh, from Israel and it's the largest case series ever presented. So uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, going back to the AC2 enzyme and uh, its function as a receptor for, for, for the virus, the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis is a very complex axis, uh, which I'm not going to explain right now. Uh, but you can see here the action of the AC2 enzyme. So the action of the AC2 enzyme is to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin uh, 1, 9, and um, angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1, 7. But you can see in its characteristic that AC2 uh, is a very um, positive for health uh, enzyme. Uh, it's an enzyme which has substantial benefits. Uh, you see that it promotes vasodilation, it prevents uh, inflammation, it prevents uh, fibrosis in several organs. So it's basically uh, a beneficial enzyme uh, for the human body and for several um, organs and uh, organ systems. Now, until uh, the, the, the pandemic, I mean, uh, before the pandemic, 
What we knew was that smoking and nicotine, and, and there is some confusion, most of the studies were um, evaluating uh, smoking, not nicotine, but we knew that smoking and nicotine down-regulate ACE2. And here is a characteristic uh, graph from um, a review of uh, the evidence from 2018, so a recent review, which shows that angiotensin um, converting enzyme 2 is down-regulated by smoking and uh, nicotine. And this um, is expected to be detrimental for uh, heart health, basically for the cardiovascular system. So uh, smoking and nicotine uh, have effects on ACE2, which are bad for the lungs, the heart, and the central nervous system, but they appear to be good for coronavirus. But things change in 2020, and there are several studies which have shown that, um, mainly genetic studies, which are showing that smokers uh, upregulate uh, ACE2, and uh, COPD patients also have higher expression of ACE2. Uh, and um, as you can see here in the graphs, uh, so the author suggested that this upregulation is in fact detrimental because it will promote viral invasion and cell entry in smokers. Uh, another study uh, also showed uh, basically the same effects. Um, and uh, although there is no difference between age um, groups and gender, which is strange because we know that COVID-19 is um, uh, much more uh, severe in uh, older people and in men. Uh, however, they didn't find any uh, change in the any difference in the regular in the expression of ACE2 between males and females or according to age. But in general, the 2020 studies have shown uh, and have concluded that smoking increases ACE2 expression, and this ex uh, increased expression uh, is um, translated into an in increased susceptibility for COVID-19, which is contrary to the. Uh, epidemiological and clinical observations, of course. But let's see what's happening with um, ACE2. ACE2, indeed, is very important for uh, viral uh, cell entry. It's very important for the virus to attach to the cell and to introduce the genetic material to the cell. And you see here that in ACE knockout mice, which means that, ACE, uh, that mice that do not express ACE2, uh, these mice uh, did not develop uh, disease, uh, while mice which were uh, which were wild type, so they, they, they were expressing the ACE2 uh, gene, they had uh, much more uh, severe um, disease, mainly attachment of the spike um, uh, to, the, to the cells. A big problem with the coronavirus, and this is uh, mainly for SARS-1, but the same is probably happening with SARS-2, is that once the cell uh, is uh, attacked by the virus, there is an immediate under-expression uh, uh, of uh, ACE2. And you can see here, while the uninfected cells, uh, the uninfected um, um, uh, animals had a lot of ACE2, ACE2 suddenly disappeared after the infection. Uh, and this is detrimental because in an animal model where they induced uh, lung damage by acid inhalation, um, acid aspiration, and um, they had administered um, the spike glycoprotein of SARS-1 before um, um, as, uh, as the aspiration of the, of the, of the acid, uh, they saw that the damage was much worse uh, when spike glycoprotein was introduced before the, the acid, and that was because there were uh, no uh, AC2, uh, there was no AC2 enzyme in the lung. So AC2 is a protective factor for lung damage. It um, promotes um, the reduction of inflammation and uh, it promotes tissue healing and it prevents um, tissue damage. Mm. So um, what uh, seems to be happening is that yes, ACE2 is needed uh, in order to, for the virus to attack uh, the cells, but uh, if there is an ACE2 deficiency, then of course, ACE2 will never be zero, so still there will be receptors for the virus to enter the cells. But a, a previous deficiency of ACE2 is probably even more detrimental because it will fail to protect the, the tissue from the viral attack and from the uh, resulting inflammation. 
So in reality, we are going to have a huge problem, uh, an even more serious problem when the AC2 is downregulated. So uh, this creates a question whether the upregulation caused by smoking is in reality detrimental or not. And uh, despite the um, uh, authors suggesting that it is detrimental, the clinical observations uh, appear to show uh, otherwise, to show the contrary. So uh, let's see uh, what's happening through another mechanism, another potential mechanism through which smoking and mainly nicotine may interact with the, with the, with the virus. So we have seen that um, there is a low smoking prevalence in hospitalized uh, patients, of course. Uh, this led us to uh, generate a new hypothesis that the, perhaps there is a direct interaction between the virus and um, uh, the uh, nicotinic cholinergic system. Um, why did we say that? First of all, the nicotinic cholinergic system has strong anti-inflammatory properties. And uh, there is a so-called cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. And you can see the overview here in the two graphs. And uh, you see that um, it is basically a central mechanism through the vagus nerve and through the centers in the brain of the vagus nerve, uh, which is a two-way communication. It receives information from the periphery about the inflammatory status. It delivers messages to the periphery in order to modulate and to control uh, this inflammatory uh, status. Uh, so um, mainly through the vagus nerve and mainly through uh, alpha-7 uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are present everywhere in the lungs, in the immune system, in the macrophages, uh, in uh, all, uh, in many cell systems, including the endothelium, the heart, uh, the intestine. So uh, they are everywhere. And this is a way to control the immune response so that it doesn't um, uh, get uncontrolled, which results in cytokine storm. And we know very well that cytokine sto storm is the hallmark of severe COVID. Basically, all COVID patients don't die from the virus itself. They die from a hyperinflammatory response, which cannot be controlled because the immune system is completely dysregulated. And we thought initially that this uh, cholinergic anti-inflammatory system may help in um, uh, controlling this hyperinflammatory response. Uh, so, as I showed you before, the receptor binding domain and the receptor binding motif, when we looked at the um, amino acid sequences, because this is a protein, so proteins are made from amino acids. When we looked at the amino acid sequences of the receptor binding domain, we found within the receptor binding domain and just next to the receptor binding motif, um, a, an amino acid sequence which is homologous with snake uh, venom toxins. And uh, here we also show a three-dimensional structure of um, a snake venom toxin and of the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, that part of the receptor binding domain, which is homologous. And you see that they have um, th the same structure, basically. And why this is important? Because snake venom toxins are uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor antagonists. So they bind and then prevent uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine uh, receptors from um, uh, functioning properly. We perform some molecular docking experiments. This is, uh, these are experiments of um, looking at the three-dimensional structure um, of uh, the virus and of the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Uh, and by looking at the specific amino acids at specific sites and the, the, the structure, the form and the geometry of the molecules, you are trying to find through computational modeling whether there may be an interaction between uh, two uh, different proteins or a protein in the medication. Uh, molecular docking experiments are being done by the pharmaceutical industry very frequently in order to find new medications or to repurpose medications. And we found, and we are showing here some um, um, images uh, of our model, we found that, uh, yes, through the computational uh, experiments, there is an interaction between the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein, uh, which is displayed here in purple-blue color, uh, and 
the um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. This is the alpha-7 uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And uh, the computational models uh, told us that it is possible for the spike glycoprotein to bind into the acetylcholine receptor, which may, of course, result in a dysfunction of these receptors. Uh, and one of the functions, as I said, is the anti-inflammatory effects. So we generated the hypothesis. We generated the hypothesis that um, SARS-CoV-2 is not interacting only with ACE2 uh, enzyme, but also with nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and how this is done. Um, we know that the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway works through the alpha-7 acetylcholine receptors, and the way that it works is to control uh, through um, a, a bidirectional communication with the brain, control the release of, of inflammatory mediators and cytokines, and prevent the uh, development of cytokine storm of uncontrolled immune and inflammatory response. So the virus interacts with the AC, with the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. By interacting with the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, it prevents it from working, from functioning. So in reality, what is happening is that we don't have this bidirectional communication, the control of the inflammatory response, but instead we have an increase of cytokine um, uh, of cytokines uh, in the bloodstream or locally in some tissues, which cannot be modulated and controlled. So we have uncontrolled inflammation and cytokine release, which can result, of course, in serious uh, tissue damage or even death. And what we propose um, to do with nicotine or even nicotinic acetylcholine um, and nicotinic agonists, other uh, molecules. Uh, what we propose to do is these nicotinic agonists will protect the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and by protecting the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, its function, its functionality will be restored, and by restoration, uh, we are going to have, again, the bidirectional communication with the brain through the uh, vagus nerve and the proper functioning of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which are going to control and modulate the inflammatory response and um, promote immune homeostasis. So the immune response will be suppressed instead of uh, being propagated um, uncontrollable. In conclusion, we can say that severe COVID-19 is definitely a disease of, the, of immune dysregulation and hyperinflammation, the so-called cytokine storm. Um, the nicotinic cholinergic system is an immune modulator. And smoking appears to be uh, underrepresented among COVID-19 patients, especially among hospitalized patients. There is so much data right now that it's very hard to, to, to ignore that. Uh, so we think that nicotine is the most plausible candidate to have positive effects um, in tobacco cigarette smoke. And in fact, if, that, if this is true, then we expect that nicotine effects, uh, the beneficial effects, are going to be masked by the adverse effects of smoking, either by the other toxins in tobacco cigarette smoke or by comorbidities that smokers are suffering from. Uh, there are two potential mechanisms for an interaction between nicotine and the virus. One is an indirect interaction through the ACE2 uh, up or down regulation and um, expression. Um, so nicotine may affect uh, AC2 expression, and we see some evidence on that, but it's not clear that this is the uh, mechanism behind the potentially protective effects. And the other mechanism is that the AC2, uh, the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, uh, are directly interacting with the virus. So this is a direct uh, interaction between SARS CoV 2 and the nicotinic cholinergic system. And in that case, nicotine or other nicotine agonists could um, protect the receptors from um, viral uh, attack. Uh, these are still hypotheses. We have not documented that in experiments, so we need more experiments in vitro and in vivo animal and human studies, and eventually, of course, a clinical trial to uh, address this issue. So thank you very much from Virtual Warsaw. Thank you.